Okay, I'm not muted. And it is Baby Friday, and we've already had a lively chat. Thanks, guys, for joining early. I appreciate it. That helps me get started um, and figure out what people want to see. There was some questions in the chat. One, I have an email address, lou-leaves-the-room at gmail. Um, what's weird about that is I had a dog named Louie, and I have a piano upstairs, and every time I would play the piano, Louie would leave the room. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that might be an indication I'm not great at the piano. That is a true statement. I am not great at the piano, but I'm also maybe really loud, and I just get really into it, and there's a lot of gusto, uh, but not very skillful gusto, just, just loud gusto mostly. So left the room, left the room. So anyway, inspired an email address that has stuck with me for years. You know how you pick an email address when you're, I don't know, a lot of people pick an email address when they're 12 and then they're 40 and they're like, yeah, it's, it's Todd sniper hit, you know, whatever at Gmail. And you're like, well, that's a weird email address to put on a resume. Maybe, maybe, maybe one should update their email address with a more professional sounding name. I have not taken that advice, I am afraid. Um, <laughs> one of the questions that was in the chat, let me start there, uh, let me start here. I'm Gabe, the Oscope Wizard. Welcome to the Techno Lair. Thank you so much for joining me. We're gonna nerd out. And eventually we're gonna get to our quest of building a DIY Sono style amplifier. We are elbows deep into this build process. We have all sorts of things going. But one of the questions that happened in chat was how would one test USB uh, fixtures? So you can always purchase a really fancy fixture. Do I have one around here? I may have one, hold on just one second. I may even have one. Ugh. Ugh. So um, my company here, Roden Schwartz, sells a really fancy test fixture uh, that you can purchase. So this is one way to test um, USB and you'll get a fixture that looks something like this with all sorts of uh, doodads on it and connectors. Uh, another way though, if you're just at the house and you want to look at a USB fixture, realize not everybody is doing this professionally. A lot of people are just doing this for fun as their hobby, which is kind of what we're talking about here. We're talking about building cool things for your house, like this amplifier we're working on. Not that it's not cool to build cell phones for work. I mean, if you can get paid for what you love, do it. Never have to work a day in your life. I think that's a dad joke. Am I supposed to say a dad joke when I do that? That might be a... If you can do what you love for work, you never have to work a day in your life. Dad. Not a joke, just dad. I feel like every time dads give you advice, it's almost a joke, accidentally. Um, here is an example of a USB test fixture that I have purchased off of Amazon. Um, it is really, let's see if we can get it uh, focused in, but really tiny, you see you got the USB, what is this, the USB A connector, I think. Um, and so you would plug your USB cable into that, and then it kind of feeds it out to these header pins. So these, this is just a 100 mil header. Um, there you go, find it camera. My camera is struggling. It's like, I don't know. You're asking me to do too many things. I wanted to focus on your eyes, so stop trying to do other things. But this little guy has headers. Um, so, one of the things you can do is get a passive probe like this. And just, there's an accessory kit you can buy for passive probes. Every passive probe will have some sort of kit. And this kit breaks the passive probe out into little header pins that then I can slide conveniently over this 100 mil header. And throughout the project that I'm working on, on, on the live stream, the, the amplifier project, I have been using this adapter kit a lot. I love this little adapter kit. Um, so uh, if you wanted some part numbers and you wanted to order it from Rody, ZP10 passive probe, an excellent passive probe, and the RTZA1 adapter kit here, 
Uh, let's, you know what? Let's get a little bit better picture. I think I can get a better picture if I go over, if I go over here, here's the ZA-1 passive. Uh, this has got all the little accessories, including the header adapter. Here is the header adapter. You see this a lot on the show. And then this is my little uh, uh, USB test fixture that I purchased off of Amazon um, because I just wanted to get to the, the, the pins of USB, you know? You're at the house, you're like, how can I break this apart without having to solder everything? Because maybe you're not the best solderer. I am not the best solderer. I am a terrible solderer. So if I can get a connector or an adapter, I'm going to definitely do that. It makes life a lot easier. Um, okay, uh, yeah, yes. In the chat, it's like, can you send me a link? Sure, I'll, you know what? I'll post a link to all the little kits and doodads and accessories um, that I just showed in the description of the video. And, uh, and, I'll, and I'll respond to the comments as well. Uh, one other suggestion was, could I, so I have been struggling with angry cicadas, I call that angry cicadas. It's actually EMI noise that is leaking from my Raspberry Pi and just getting everywhere in my system. So I have solved that problem by isolating the Raspberry Pi onto its own power supply, this DC to DC regulator, and then putting my analog section over here, both spaced distance-wise by um, length, volume, length and volume. Just, it's away, okay, it's, it's away. Uh, and then I have a separate DC to DC adapter that is um, powering my little DAC chip. But the question is, could I have enveloped my Raspberry Pi section in a metal box? And yes, that is definitely a direction I could have taken. And I really have, I'm still not totally giving up on that idea. I don't... Um, have the means myself to manufacture a metal box. So I was looking to see if I could get a metal box or maybe even some thin metal that I could bend around the Raspberry Pi. I am still on the lookout. If you have a great idea on how I could encapsulate the Raspberry Pi while still having access to the GPIO pins, that was my trick. I could totally box things up, which is one of the things um, that inside of electronics, like inside of your cell phone, let me find it. Inside of here will be tiny little metal boxes around all the sensitive components that are soldered down to the ground plane of the printed circuit board inside the phone. So they'll create little tiny, what they call Faraday cages. Um, so I thought about doing the same thing to my Raspberry Pi. I just don't know how, I'm, I am struggling with how to mechanically make that happen. I. I'm not sure. I want to be smarter, guys. I want to be smarter, but I uh, still struggle with that, like the small stuff. Um, so please drop your suggestions in the comments. Sh you can actually com uh, email me directly if you want to, or even you could uh, hit me up on Instagram, at OscopeWizard, um, where I do post some videos and pictures as I set different, set different things up for every show. Um, I have done a bunch of behind, kind of behind the scenes pictures, I guess. Scope picture of the day. I was doing that for a while. I might do that again. It's not a bad idea. Okay. What are we, so I have derailed myself, but I'm going to get back on the, pull the engine back onto the rails. We are doing Python work. We are trying to make our LED ring, the NeoPixel ring, which I learned was called a NeoPixel. Um, represent the volume and eventually represent other things like represent the source that is plain sound. Um, I would like it to tell me that the external input is coming in. It's basically going to be the user interface, the, the feedback part of the user interface system for my amplifier. The input will be this knob and button combo, which uh, is still working, still turning, it's turning the external input on. Yay! Um, but I want it to represent the uh, user experience. So, with that in mind, let's start my timer so that I can keep myself on track. I've noticed the last couple of shows hadn't started a timer. And guess what? Unsurprisingly, the shows ran super duper long. Super duper long. Um, I will begin uh, first describing my setup 
and then we'll talk about what we're going to do. So my setup is two, I have two probes connected today, and what they are doing is monitoring the rotary encoder that I have on the front of the, of the, the uh, scope. I want to monitor the rotary encoder A pin and the rotary encoder B pin, which is how I tell which direction the rotary encoder is turning. I need to check that out one more time. And I am also connected to GPIO pin 12 uh, with my NeoPixel. So that's how I'm communicating to the NeoPixel. And I mentioned that I've picked GPIO 12 for a specific reason, and that is because GPIO 12 can do pulse width modulation, from what I understand. Uh, and if I go back to this website um, that is describing how to use the NeoPixel library, we got to the point where we were able to light up our NeoPixel and blink it red, which was a pretty solid way to finish the last episode. But now I want to take this to the next step and do more things than just blink it red. I would like to pretend like the volume is turning up and so slowly but surely increase the number of pixels that are illuminated and then turn back down. So I'm going to reduce the number of pixels that are illuminated and we're going to see if we can make that happen. You will see that in this comment section for this code, it says you must connect the data pin to D10, D12, D18, or D21. And D12 was the open pin on my Raspberry Pi. I was using D18 to do I2S, um, D10, maybe I could have done D10. Uh, but D12 was like right there beside the wire that I'd already plugged in. Man, I am a creature of convenience, as all humans seem to be. So I just moved it from D6 over to D12. Um, that was my big uh, epiphany, but it works. So we're connected to D12. Um, so with that in mind, let's get into some coding to see what we can make happen really quickly. Can we illuminate more than a single LED? I don't know. Maybe we can. We were working with LED test.py before LED underscore test.py. And you know what I should also do is probably show this at the same time. So one, well, that didn't work. Grabbing the wrong one. Grabbing the wrong picture here. There we go. Let's put this in the corner so that we can actually see the LEDs while we are editing the code. And, and maybe, maybe it'll be something fun to watch. So let's pseudo nano LED, LED underscore test dot PY. Um, and you can see my, my code was super simple. So I tell it that I am connected to D12 and then I told it that I have 12 LEDs on my ring and then I proceeded to write to LED 0 which is the first LED in the ring. I turned it red. I waited a second. I turned it off. I waited a second. I turned it red again. Now what I want to do is slowly but surely write to more LEDs in the ring. Um, so let's add a, a second variable here. And we are going to just call it numpixels. Numpixels. And we are going to call that, and we're going to make that 12. And so now we are slowly but surely moving towards object oriented programming, which will hopefully prevent us from writing spaghetti code. Another thing that I want to do is there is, um, let's see, there is a brightness variable that I can set and in the in the example you can see they do brightness of 0 0.2. I want to play with that a little bit to feel to figure out what I can do with brightness. Can I I really want to be able to pulse my LEDs while things are happening just to make it feel more alive. I love pulsing LEDs. Um, and then most importantly I want to turn auto write to false. What that presumably does is forces me to call a command pixels.show and I can write to the pixel memory and it won't update what the pixel is doing until I call pixels.show which is cool so now I can like clear the LED memory and write something new and then show the new thing which will help me I think 
go down in volume. Let's see if I can do something cool like a for loop. Now, I have cheated a little bit. Do, 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 and I'm going to recreate something I've already done. So let's start a for loop. I have my number of pixels defined and I have my pixel object. So for I I, I think you do for I in range, I just assumes to be zero, which I do love that about Python. To number of pixels, I think I might need to do for I in range number of pixels minus one. We'll find out. Um, oh, let's see, one, two, three. Now I want to start writing something to the pixels. So what I would like to do is pixels i, so that's going to write to a specific pixel. And then we want to write, let's write the color, let's do, instead of, instead of doing red, let's do blue. So that should be blue. And then I believe I need to do pixels dot show not shows, show, um, and then I will do, let's do, let's sleep. So what should happen is, we'll sleep for a second so we can follow this. What this should do is write to each pixel in my LED, turn it on, and then wait a second, and then turn the next one on. And I want to come down here, and then when I exit the for loop, I would like to pixels dot fill. I'm going to clear the pixels. I think that's it. Um, whoop, let's clear it with zero. I will, of course, mess this up the first time, and then we'll do pixels dot sleep. And do the whole loop again and again and slow, slow, but what this should do is illuminate the pixels of the ring, all the pixels, blue, we'll find out if this works. And then if that works, we'll know that we can write to every pixel with the for loop, which is how it should work. Then we can start experimenting with tying that to my volume knob or my rotary encoder. So let's save this. And then let's try running it. So Python 3 LED test.py. We should be able to see the pixels. You can see my finger pointing to it in the top right corner of the screen. We'll see, we'll see. Does it work? Oh, look, 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 it's working, it's working. More LEDs are turning on, guys. Yay, thumbs up. Does it fill it up and then clear it? Or, does, ah. <laughs> oh, man. Oh man, well, of course I messed something up. Also, also one of the LEDs did not illuminate, um, which is a little tough to see since my camera is just like kind of blowing out for any sort of, uh, any sort of light. So maybe, maybe Python starts at one instead of zero. It probably does. That's probably what happens. Some programming languages start at zero, some start at one when you instantiate an object. So I've instantiated I here and I guess it fills it in with one. I, I don't know. Do, do, do. Yeah, I think so. So um, I messed up this call. Let's try this. Because um, when I fill it, I want to fill it with the color and I think you can also add like a couple of other arguments on there, but I just want to send it the color of off, so the color of blank. So let's try again. Let's try again. All right, you can see it's, it's getting more LEDs illuminated as it goes around. Every second, another LED is turned on. All of them are turned on, and did I call pixels.sleep? What in the world am I doing here?
have I ever written code before? Time, time. Dot, I mean, I had literally written time.sleep. Guys, you're supposed to catch that in the chat. Chat, wake up, help me out. Help me out, guys. Let's try one more time to see if we can just get our for loop to work. Our for loop is working. The other logic that I have added is illogical. Feels like something that Dr. Spock would say. There we go. All right, we're working. We're in an infinite loop. Where is, this is where we like to operate in infinite loops. Everybody loves an infinite loop. How long do I want this to work? Forever. What does it do? Nothing. It just eats PCP, PCU cycles. It eats PCU cycles, which are the regurgitations of CPUs. Um, all right. Okay. That's cool. That's cool. We have a for loop. Now, now, um, if I go back and make my board big again, I have the rotary encoder, and we are connected to the rotary encoder with these two scope probes. Using my handy dandy 100 mil adapter cable, these little header cables, these little header adapters so that I can plug into the header, uh, makes it a lot easier. Use the right tool for the job. I say that and then I clearly, I'm always using the wrong probe for the job. I'm doing it over and over again. I'll get better at it. Uh, let's go to my scope though. Back to the scope, back to the scope. I want to... So I want to preset the scope. I already have it set up, so I have cheated a little bit. Before I got on, I cheated. Um, but the reason I cheated is because scope setup is, I mean, it's cool to see a couple of times, but then it gets kind of boring because you're like, I understand scope wizard. I understand. Um, but what I wanted to highlight was that both rotary encoder pins are normally high. So they default to a state of 1-1. One, one. Uh, and when I turn the knob, they go low and then they go back high. That's, they want to be at their steady state of one one. So they have pull up resistors in there. Um, and the order of the edges. So if I go, now I want to go to normal because I want to look at individual edges here. You can see that um, green goes high first here and then pink goes low and then green goes low and then pink goes high and then green goes high. So pink is first in this order, and if I turn the other direction, let's see, am I armed here? There I am, I'm armed. I got the weight state over here. There we go, now pink, green, pink, and that was the same, and now this should be, what in the world? Pink, green, pink? It's supposed to be green, pink, green. It's supposed to be the other way. Man, Let's see if we can make this work. Here we go. So it was pink, green, pink, green. Now it's green, pink, green, pink. So I'm turning it in. I'm turning it counterclockwise versus clockwise. These edges, the way that they come in, the order that they arrive, is what determines whether it's clockwise or counterclockwise. We went over that in another video, but I wanted to re-highlight that because because. Did you guys go watch dot, 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 dot? It is, it is worth a quick, it's worth a quick look. Worth a quick look, see. Because we want to handle our rotary encoders. Before, we were letting mood audio handle our rotary encoders. But now we want to handle the rotary encoder ourselves because we are going to do more things with the rotary encoder than just volume. We're going to control these LEDs. And, and eventually, I'm adding some digital potentiometers that we will control to adjust the hardware volume. I've messed around with software volume, and one of the problems I'm having is that in order to keep the amplifier at a maximal level, it just amplifies all the noise to a maximal level, so then your signal to noise ratio goes terrible, and basically what that equals is hiss in your speakers at all times, which is unacceptable. That's not how a real system would operate, um, unless you're, like, I guess, doing an arena rock show. I'm generally not doing arena rock shows in my driveway. Um, so I would like to automatically reduce the volume. I want to reduce the volume 
when no sound when the amplifier is off I want to reduce the volume so when I turn the amplifier on it doesn't pop and then re re return the volume to its previous state I also want to you know just control the analog volume of the amplifier with the volume knob I think that is the expectation that people would have when they use an amplifier when you turn a volume knob you expect it to control the hardware volume of the system. So that is what I'm going to implement using digital potentiometers. But before we get to that, because I don't have the digital potentiometers, they are in the mail, allegedly. We all know how shipping's going these days. I, I may have them one day. We need to make, make a rotary encoder um, handler. <laughs> a rotary encoder handler. And the rotary encoder handler that I saw, let me, let me go there, I have a, a link here, paste and go, was this, the ultimately, uh, the ultimate, the ultimate rotary encoder switch decoder. This guy right here, one of the, again, I love the Raspberry Pi community, because whatever problem you are facing, someone else has usually encountered it and has thought on it and probably has come up with a very elegant solution. So this person, this person, oh man, Roj, Roj, um, encountered this problem, gave it some thought, uh, and this person, yes, it was, said, listen, what I need to do is look at the rotary encoder when it goes to its steady state and then figure out what it was in the state before that to figure out the um, difference or to figure out the direction. So he adds two event detects, which are awesome. Uh, it's a way to have a hardware interrupt on your Raspberry Pi. I, I'm really loving these event detects on the GPIO. And he looks for a rising edge on either encoder pin A or encoder pin B. Either time, one of them goes high. Let's just check what was happening. Um, and then in the um, actual code, he locks the thread, which I don't even, I mean, that was like getting a little bit beyond my understanding, but there is a thread when you go into the interrupt. So we're going to hold it in that thread while we do stuff to it. And then we're going to check the direction. So this, this little rotary interrupt subroutine checks the direction um, and then either increases a number, so this is my encoder counter, my rotary encounter, or decreases a number. Guess what? That's going to correspond to our volume level. And I have already written this out to a certain extent. And we will see if I can just make this into that. Is it not going to go all the way up? Come on, guys. Come on, guys. Sometimes. Some, there we go. Do not betray me, computer. Okay, so let's go back into our code and see if we can just get something for the rotary encoder working. Where are we? Te uh, what was our file called? LED test. LED test.py. Okay, we're going to make some more definitions here. We are going to import, let's, well, we got to import our GPIO stuff, that's for sure. GPIO as GPIO. What else do we need to import? Um, I got to import threading because we want to lock the thread when I go into this, um, when I go into this, uh, encoder thread. I need to have a definition for encoders. So let's see if I can do that. I'm going to copy and paste some stuff now. Make it a little bit faster. Oop. Paste. There we go. So I have an encoder pin on 23 and 24. That's what we had it on before when we were letting Mood just handle it. And I need to do some GPIO setup. So let's do all the GPIO setup. Oh my gosh. I did have the timer on. I did have the timer on. Five minutes remaining. 
Five minutes remaining. We are staying on track and on time today, which I'm pretty excited about. Um, let's get the GPIO set up. Get the rest of my stuff copied in here. You think I should, I can't figure out if I should just put the source code directly into the comments of the YouTube video or should I link them on GitHub or something? I don't know how to work GitHub. So I was thinking about just putting them into the comments of the YouTube section, um, which is definitely one way to do it. So let's, that is the definition of all my, Yes, I believe this is the definition of all the variables that I need. And then I can define the, so here is the actual interrupt, the rotary encoder interrupt that the, the, the guy wrote. Um, and he added some events. So we got to add those events. So let's copy this, paste it. So here are my hardware interrupts that happen on GPIO rising. So when either A or B rise, so when they go from low to high, I want to go into this interrupt. Um, first of all, I want to read the pins. So whatever state they are right now, read them in to A and B. And then I want to say if encoder A, so the previous state, equals the current state for both pins, nothing has happened. Um, so let's, let's read them in to in the previous state. Um, if they are both high, so if uh, the current state is one, one, then lock the thread because I'm going to do some stuff. So if the pin that called it is uh, encoder pin B, then I'm going to say it's clockwise, else it's counterclockwise. So if it's one, one, and B called it, that means A was already, was, uh, was not yet high. Um, so it was, before that, it was a zero, one. Um, but if A is the pin that calls, then it's one, zero, which means it's the other way. Um, Anyway, you might have to work through that logic for a second. Um, and I'm not sure it always works, and it is not perfectly debounced. Still, I'm still working on debouncing this idea, but we'll, we'll get there. Now, obviously, I am working with a variable called volume LED, which I have not defined yet. But what I did, um, in order to continue, on the small bit of computer science that I had in college, they tell me that I'm supposed to write things in objects. And why? It's because I can do a lot of work in the object and it makes my code a little bit easier to understand, a little bit easier to follow, and a lot easier to edit down the road. So what I did was I made a volume LED object that defines itself, it holds the volume, it keeps track of the volume itself, it also writes to the pixels. So uh, what, what I want this volume object to do eventually is write to the pixel, pixels and the digital potentiometers to set everything up for the system. And I can handle all of my logic in this object without having it spread out through my entire program. So I set up a NeoPixel object. I tell it I also keep track of the number of pixels because I couldn't figure out how to pull the number of pixels back from the NeoPixel object. I don't know. I was running into a bunch of trouble there. So I, I kept a separate variable for that and I kept track, keep track of the volume. That's what I do when I initially instantiate this object. Then I have a couple of subroutines, a couple of routines in this object. One of them is a volume up routine, which basically just adds one to the volume number, and then it calls a subroutine called write LED. And then I have a volume down, which subtracts one from the volume if it is larger than zero, and then write to LED. And what does write LED do? So write LED figures out the number of LEDs, the number of pixels to turn on to represent the volume level. 
So the volume goes from 0 to 100. My pixels go from 0 to 11 or 1 to 12. So I need to translate my 0 to 100 number to 1 to 12. And this is what this logic does. So I take a percentage, I multiply it by 12, and then I turn that into an integer because I don't have any partial pixels. I can only turn on full pixels. I, um, right here, I print the pixel count. That's just for my own edification to know how many I'm supposed to be turning on. And then I clear the pixels first. I found this to be important. I clear the pixels and then I write to the proper number of pixels with the color white. And then I show the pixels. So that is what I am doing every time this happens. We will see if this works. So I believe, I believe I can delete all of this because now I'm doing all of my work with event handlers. So my infinite loop will say while true, just sleep, just sleep. That is all I want you to do. Now, when I turn the knob clockwise, I want you to call volume up. And when I turn it counterclockwise, I want to call volume down. And hopefully, LEDs will be written and unwritten and rewritten. Uh, we, we shall see. Let us try it out. We'll see. And pixel pen not defined. That's because I forgot to make a definition. Of course, of course, of course. Pixel pen, pixel pen. Let's add the other definitions that I did not add before for some reason. I believe I need these two things defined. I forgot to define them for some reason. I'm not sure why, but I need to tell the program that pixel pin is D12 because I have connected my NeoPixel to pin 12. And then I need to tell the program that I have 12 pixels in my NeoPixel. Okay, now, now I believe I have it set. Let's try this now. Oh my gosh, no, 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 no. I'm adding an E there for some reason. Is it happy? It seems happy. Let's turn on my webcam so you can see the board over here. Let's see if pixels light up here. Pixels aren't lighting up, I don't think. Goodness gracious alive. Something's not working. Ah! Am I going into the interrupt? I could have some things backwards. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. That's not a big deal. That's not a big deal. It didn't work right out of the gate. That's fine. We've taken my extra five minutes to see if I could get it working. Guys, guys, it was the outro. It was the, <laughs> it was the outro. <laughs> I think I'll edit this. I'll probably edit this. Uh, I'll probably have to download the video and re-edit it. That'll be fine. The problem, the problem I think might be that I disconnected my rotary encoder from my Raspberry Pi in order to probe it. So <laughs> that is one reason why my program is not working because my rotary encoder is not plugged in. Uh, I just, I want to try to plug it in to see if I can make it happen. So let me disconnect the oscilloscope. Let's get the silly scope out of the way here. Um, and I have it plugged into these wires. Oh my goodness. My mom would be so proud. She, she loves picking on me when I forget to plug stuff in. There was a time when I was young and I was di diagnosing a broken computer and I was just flummoxed why this computer wasn't working. Um, 
ultimately, it's because I had forgotten to connect the power cord, which is, that is a real, that's a real stumbling block to try to overcome. Now I have the rotary encoder plugged in. Look, look at this. Look at this. The code works as I increase the volume. So I'm turning it clockwise. The code gets more LEDs illuminated. And as I go counterclockwise, fewer LEDs are lit up. It works. The code works. Which is, which is good because honestly, I had tested the code before the show. So if the code hadn't worked, we can see, you can see I even keep track of the volume here on the side uh, in the comments. So as I turn it, the volume increases and more LEDs illuminate. And then, so nine should be eight, seven LEDs should be lit up. So there we go. The code works. You know what's funny is that every time I come to the end of an episode, I'm always worried like, what am I gonna do the next episode? It is so simple. You're just gonna continue debugging because there's always going to be one more problem to fix. So in the next episode, I'll have the code working. I'll go over what the problem was. We'll figure it out. We'll see if we can make the rotary encoder both increase and decrease the number of LEDs that are illuminated on my LED pixel ring. I might even get the pixel ring installed onto the front of my amplifier, which is ultimately where it's gonna be. It's gonna go right behind the volume knob and hopefully cast a gentle glow around the volume knob, which I think will look pretty cool. But thank you for hanging out with me here in the techno lair for about half an hour while we nerded out and tried to figure out all sorts of things. I'm gonna post the link to the probe and accessory kit so that you can also probe header pins easily. Uh, when you are doing your debug at your house. And I'll also post the Python code that I used today after I fix it. First, I'll, I'll fix it first before I post it so that the Python code in the comments actually works for you. Anyway, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I don't know all the nerds in the world. Please share this with the nerd in your life and maybe consider, hey, hit that subscribe button so that you can be notified the next time I'm going to do a show, which will be next week. Otherwise, I'm going to hang out in the chat for a little while. I will see you guys next week. Take it easy. Bye.